song Santa Claus is Coming to Town because it sent kids into pits of hysterical screams and sobbing cries. 1978, a group of kids kidnapped Blitzen Santa's reindeer, killed and dismembered him, hoping for immortality or magical powers. But they got neither. And we were cursed. And when you're cursed, you have to make up for your sins. Somehow. Well, to make up for our sins, our downs, children would fight for our own survival every single year at Christmas. If we lost, Santa would release his wrath on us. No survivors. In 1978, he killed half of the senior class, including Blitzen's murderer. I should say murderers. Grammy described it as a bloodbath so bad they had to rebuild the school. Parents killed themselves after seeing the remnants of what Santa had left behind. The bodies were described as dolls with no faces, shells scooped of their insides. My father competed in 1996. He won and then met my mother and married her. They had me and then he hung himself five minutes after I was born. My father probably knew I would be seen as his legacy, a target, somebody to go after and prove his bloodline. Our senior class had to kill, had to kill to survive. Spill blood in the name of Blitzen. The winner's prize was a choice, choice, allowing our down to live another year or to be drowned in darkness. Every civilian ripped apart by Santa's demonic elves. We were all trained from a very young age to choose. Ring the bell and grant living's word, living's wood, mercy, but I was covered in Lindsay, Lizzie, Lindsay, Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie. Fractured pieces of Tommy's skull clung to my sweater. I was cold, tired. I would still hear their scream. Santa chose a traumatized kid to make this choice. Cruel, but very clever, my friends. Very clever. Alex and Marie stood by my side, ready. Alex's blood slicked hand and dangled with mine. They wanted it to be fast, painless. I did slicing Marie's throat open and shooting him in the head. The town started screaming at me behind the barrier, urging me to ring the bell. Instead, I gulped down soda. When jingling, jingling, jingling bells sounded, horrified cries erupting behind the barrier. I just smiled at Santa's looming shadow. His manacled, bloodthirsty grin and tragic eyes. And I raised my coke to Blitzen.
Oh, like 
wasn't just that my stuff tossed was around in my locker carelessly, my wallet had been open and clearly been filed through. What if he had looked at my driver's license, the new one with my current address that I'd finally updated after moving almost a year ago? I suddenly felt ill, sick to my stomach and very afraid at the thought of sleeping in my own apartment. I tried to keep my voice from trembling while I called my best friend Kate and asked if I could stay with her for the night. Despite it being so late, she instantly agreed, no questions asked. I hurriedly, hurriedly, hurriedly packed my bag and headed to her apartment, taking one last look over my shoulder before I closed my car door behind me. My phone pinged again as I was driving, and I read it once I parked. I look forward to beginning our work together. I showed Kate the text once when I got to her place, part of me hoping she'd laugh and t tell me I was overreacting. I was being silly, but her face paled as she scrolled through them. She told me I could stay with her as long as I needed. Agreed that I should go to the place the next morning. She even volunteered to go with me. At the police station, I showed the guy taking my statement messages, including the one I had received overnight. That said, Jade, when are you coming home? He immediately grabbed another officer, and they both asked me questions a lot. I do remember how they shared a look when I told them I'd first encountered the guy in an art class. After we talked to the police, I spent most of the hours of the day while Kate was at work pacing around her apartment. The text he kept sending did not help my nerves. Don't worry, I perfected my methods over the years, Jay.
is wrath. How would you feel if your students arrived late in class? Smile, for she was a professor at a local college and that bothered him. The mother laughed. I didn't realize this play date was a classroom and you must be wanting supper. Can you call him please or I could go get him? Gary didn't even reply but blocked the doorway with his arm. The woman craned her neck and called out. Eventually she stopped. Gary fell backwards, sweat covering his face. His chest looked unarmed. The mother shook the blackness off her arm. The blackness dissolved into the air. She held out her hand to her son. Come along, love. She smiled to Gary's wife. Don't worry, he's fine. He'll be up soon. They left. Gary's wife and son stood still for quite a few moments. Then they do turned and went inside to have supper. Supper. My brother, my brother got into a car accident. slash no sleep by you slash terrible underscore punch punch my brother got into a car accident and what survived well it isn't human the phone call came with the violence on a windy night at the end of a cold November my phone vibrated loudly shaking the glass of water beside my bed, sending droplets over the sides. I woke with a start, turning over to grab my phone. I read the name running across the screen. I put, uh, I put the, phone, the phone to my ear. Hello, I answered crockly, crockly, crockly. My brother was on the other end of the line, crying. There was screaming in the ground loud like someone was dying. The screams eventually paused and started again louder, more heinous than before. Jason, Jason, are you there? His head panicked, sobbing. His voice kept surprise. 
sinister beyond 
He nodded yes, taking my phone, his hands I noticed were bloody too, the fingernails cracked and caked in dirt. How did, how did that happen, I wondered. If he hit a guy crossing the road, why would his hands look like that? I should have. started up, then I made my way over to 
was a man completely naked and covered in blood. There were cuts all over his back, open like bloody mouths. I half expected them to be embedded with rows of teeth. Blood ran out from all of them like fingers running down his skin. He was pale in the light and screams, cries, or even whimpers. I walked over to him slowly, crouching close, close to the ground. I avoided the puddle of blood all around him, no longer steaming. The wind blew harder and almost knocked me again to the ground as I squatted next to the man. I touched his back. Surprise, it was frigid, as if he had been dead for hours. I was afraid if I touched the bloody blood, my fingers would stick there like a tongue to a metal bowl. The giant cuts were numerous. The accident could not have caused this. Something was not right. I did not want to see him from the front, afraid I might be sick, but also to honor some memory of this man. Yet I was also curious to see if it was horrid from the back. How much worse could it be from the front? I bit my knuckle and breathed into my hands. I, my breath hovered around me like a His arms and chest were covered in the same cuts, slashed hither and fro across one another diagonally. It had to have been an animal of some sort. His genitals had been removed entirely from the body and weren't anywhere that I could see. The man's head was under his arm and his face was turned towards the pavement. Blood that lay under there, I knew there would not be much left of his face. But I had to see, I had to know, I needed to know what he looked like. The wind howled against the night, blowing the trees against one another. They creaked and struck one another, rattling like bones. Chills ran across my body, up to my neck. Stood on end. I crouched closer to the man, reaching out my hand for his arm. My fingers enclosed around his wrist, which did not seem as cold, considering they were near his mouth. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. I lifted his arm and threw it to the side. seeing didn't make any sense. There was no possible way it could. My breath stopped. Slowly I stood up and backed away from the body. The face was all cut off. The mouth open wide and deep. Part of his gums missing. One of his eyes had been plucked. Plucked out and laid down the pavement like a golf ball in play. It was surprising to me that I could even recognize a face amongst all should have been the last thing on my mind, considering I knew exactly who it was I was looking at. The body was my brother, Eddie. Face of my brother smashed into the pavement, frozen blood seeping through his lips. My brother completely still and dead on the ground. My stomach flipped. I felt a tug in my throat. There was nothing up. I dry heaved and kept walking back away from away from the headlights. Everything had turned upside down. The phone call, the drive here, the interaction with Eddie. Eddie, Eddie, I said. Whoever I had talked to on the phone and in person and now was sitting in my car was not my brother. Why hadn't the cops arrived yet? I stuck my hands in my pocket for my keys and then I remembered at them. I almost laughed at the awfulness of this. The sheer shock nearly sent me into fits of hysterics. You see, I didn't have horror movies every time and read it in horror novels. No phone, no keys, no way out. It's just you and whatever 
what's left there for me was not my brother, Eddie. Jason, the voice that called me, came from the woods. It was a whisper, low and hoarse, that ran against my skin and ears. I cringed and stepped away from the headlights, speed walking to Eddie's car. I tugged at the handle. Locked. Fuck. Jason, please. The voice pleaded like a child. It sounded just like Eddie, and as he had sounded when he was a boy, calling for his older save him. I didn't answer. I hid behind the passenger door and closed my eyes. I opened them and looked around me. I didn't see any one or anything, but I did see a few rocks on the side of the road, large in size with jagged edges. Jason, I love you. Jason, I need you. That's not you. That's not you. That's not you. I whispered repeatedly. smaller rock at the side of my car near one of the back windows. Immediately after, I stood up on both feet, lifted the other rock, and smashed the passenger seat window. The window cracked, but did not break. I heard the swift patter of footsteps from a distance. I panicked and hit the window again, and this time it shattered. Frantically, I reached my hand in, cut my fingers on the glass, and pulled and fumbled for the ignition. I felt the key sitting there and started the car. I looked out the window next to me and for a moment I saw what looked like Eddie standing on the driver's side of my car. He was watching me emotionless. Then he smiled, revealing a large rows of needle-like teeth, his jaw unhinged and gaped open at me. Laughter that pierced the right through the night and into my ears. I screamed, put the car into drive, and sped down the road, ignoring everything else. I screamed for I don't know how long, cried, wept, and pounded the steering wheel. I turned on the high beams and kept driving, not slowing down. When I did eventually slow down, I stopped in the middle.
course comes for me. I would like an easier way out, if anything. Sometimes I wonder what my brother had been thinking in his final moments, if he knew what it was, if he accepted his fate, or had fought back. I would like to think it was quick for him, like a candle being screams I heard and can't help but wonder if that was my brother. Maybe he felt that thing tearing into his back and stomach, shattering his teeth, ripping out his eyeball, tearing away his genitals. And at this point, I don't like to ponder it anymore. No good comes from it. The only memory of my brother now exists in Wikipedia pages and newspaper articles. I'm sure a documentary will be made someday and his name will pop up somewhere in the mix. They might try to interview my family and they might succeed, but they won't get to me. Whatever it was that took my brother that tur turned him into whatever it is, it burns into my memory and I do everything in my power to keep it as far away from me as possible and every single thing Except that's not possible. Because on nights like this one, when it's dark and cold, the wind blowing against my apartment windows, whistling beneath the seal, it visits me. See, it's always in the form of my brother, always. I'm sure it has other forms, other people it could morph into, but it always chooses Eddie. It's me. It's, like I said, I was always in that form of my brother. I am sure it has other forms. Other people I may have known it could morph into, but for some reason it always chooses Eddie, and sometimes it's actually nice to see him. Because for a small moment, I can pretend it is him staring back at me from the street outside my apartment window, waving at me. I never wave back despite my temptations. The wind never blows his hair out of place, never topples him over, never makes him shiver. But his eyes, his black eyes, empty, soulless stare. awkward. 
something odd outside my living 
to be honest, it gave me the creeps. Being the rational person I am, I dismissed it as my imagination. Running wild, being home alone. But as the night progressed, I got up to grab a snack from the kitchen. That's when I heard a creak. A subtle noise that sent a chill down my spine. Just found. 
nasty in my boss's bedroom. I'm not sure how to proceed. Back in June, my dad spotted the ad on the post office bulletin board. It said in bold capital letters, strong lad needed help, old lady, no weaklings, please. He punched the number into his phone and posted about his 17-year-old son, that was me. The school rugby coach called a physical specimen. Just left out the part about how I'd join the gaming and anime society instead of training with the squad. What if she thinks I'm not fit enough? I asked him on the drive out to the marina. Just tell her you wrecked your ankle and throwing a tackle and put on a, I don't know, put on a bit of bulk, who knows, to say something. a question about rugby. I don't even know the rules. She's not gonna fucking ask. <laughs> okay, but she's kind of a weirdo. Everybody says that. Even you, you told me. Half the town's decorators act like that place is radioactive. I couldn't give two shits. Wade, you're not sitting on your ass all summer. If you want to be picky about jobs, you should have thought of that before you quit cinema in the middle of your first fucking shift. But they wrote me up for eating a popcorn that was going to be thrown out anyway. It was total BS. And the petrol station. That was different. Those supervisors were just dicks. His fingers wrapped around the steering wheel in a death grip, which I took as a sign to drop, drop the subject. Knowing it was going nowhere. destination, a rocky isle named White Abbey set just off the coast of our hometown. Nobody at school knew much about the hermit who lived there except her cottage at electricity because on clear nights you could see a tiny speck of light from the beach. Years ago, a girl in my class, Jillian, swore she saw the old lady in the pharmacy check out line, threatening to put a hex on the nervous cashier for staring at her glass eye. The entire school agreed and Jilly was full of shit. I followed Dad along the marina over to the, the dune bobbing at the end of the last dock. From there he watched until I'd sailed past the bay. From there he because he thought I'd come straight back if he didn't. Twenty-five minutes later, I marooned the boat on a pebble beach. As I soaked in the landscape, my stomach felt uneasier than it did at sea. Like that, the feeling you get when you're being watched. The remote island was so large. shot behind me. I'm 
not getting any younger, the voice called, agitated now. I hurried across a filthy carpet coated with shiny slug trails. The stale air reeked of cigarettes, which probably helped mask an even worse stink, judging by all the black mold creeping out of the skirting boards. Inside a kitchen with a warped floor, an ancient lady in a pink nightie sat behind a table. Smoked away, her gaunt appearance made me picture it. Must be Wade, she said, then entered a harsh chainsaw coughing fit. That's right. That is right. Sandra, her cloudy eyes, neither of which were glass, traveled up and down my torso as she stubbed out her ciggy in a ceramic ashtray on the table. I thought your dad said you rugby. Oh yeah, I slept down, pushed out my belly, I busted my ankles, so I've been out a bit and put on a little bulk. If you need someone fitter, I can go. The old lady stood with great difficulty and then jabbed a sharp yellow fingernail into my midsection. She
spine. Furious, I tossed the machete aside and hurled the table as far as I could. This thing soared through the air, disappeared into the shoulder high weeds. I took a minute to compose myself before going to retrieve it. I went back and forth, combing the grass with my foot, finding nothing except beetles and rocks. I looked at the woodland. No way my throat got that kind of distance. Just in case, however, I pushed low branches aside, stepping over the arcs of the exposed tree roots. Up ahead, there was a sudden scuttling movement. I only got a glimpse from the corner of my eye, but enough to send goosebumps marching up my arms. A moment later, a fern got set rustling. I hurried back to the bonfire. I wiped the sweat from my forehead, feeling stupid for getting spooked. The side desk was still um, all lost amongst the weeds, but like Sandra, was ever gonna find it. I got the fire going as quickly as I could, then found her in the kitchen where she sat wheezing like an asthmatic child. All done, she asked between rasps. Aye, all done. She gave me a serious side eye before saying, in that case, have a seat, I'll make a tea. That's okay. Have a seat. The edge in her voice squeezed me into submission. Sandra moved around the room, supported by the counters. It took her a lot of trouble just to move the little ways to pour me a cup of what I thought looked like toilet water. Here it is. Herbal, good for the sinuses. I gulped the whole thing down out of politeness. So, you in school then, she asked, groaning as she eased herself into the seat facing mine. Yeah, I just finished lower six year. Hopefully my results are good, then I'll go back and do my eight levels in September. Good, good. How are you feeling? Lugging my stuff about? Just jumping? You knackered. You tired? You out of breath? Anything? Nope. She studied my face as if she didn't narrowing, then stepped her fingers. Drop that crap if you're gonna work for me. I need honesty. Almost against my will. I said I can't remember the last time I was this wrecked, okay? She grabbed an envelope from inside her night nighty. It fell onto the table with a hefty thud. That's your take home for the day. There's just one more thing I need help with. She pushed herself up, letting out an unintentional groan. Grab those lifting straps. I stepped into the front part like a onesie. Then the buckle goes around my waist. Wait, what? You deaf? No, slow then. No, it's just, you mean I need to carry you? Crap, did you put out that ad hoping to find a BDSM sex slave? my mind's eye, Dad's stern voice came barreling along. I don't care if she asks you to apply her bunion cream with your tongue. You're not sitting on your arms all summer. What's the holdup, she asked. Uh, is this a sex thing? Liquid laughter burst from her thin lips. Don't flatter yourself, kid. After all this excitement, I need to go lie down and those steps are torture on these knees on a good day. Buckles fastened around my arms and legs, and then Sandra attached to my back like a parachute. Because my passenger's fragile joints creaked and moaned worse than a haunted house in the middle of a lightning storm, I took great care climbing the stairs. Terrified, one wrong foot might have shattered her into a million different pieces. Bony ribs jabbed painfully into my spine every step of the way. All right she said, dismounting beside a bed with a worn-out headboard. I'll probably need your help for the next two or three days. Come back tomorrow, same time, and wear a pair of hiking boots. I didn't have any hiking boots, but judging by the envelope she'd given me more than enough for a new pair, I said goodbye and closed the door on my way out. 
Exactly that. 
brushing, I looked down and spat into the sink. I straightened my back and realized it took the mirror an extra second to mimic me. Everybody's worst nightmare you see in the movies all the time. My eyes widened. I couldn't understand how this was possible. I waved at it. It waved back, synchronized perfectly. It must have been in my head, but I could have sworn what I saw was not right. I'm writing in this diary because there's nowhere else to place my thoughts. My husband is on a business trip and he's not picking up the phone. 11, 21, 23. It happened again. I'm not... Oh, maybe I am. I'm going fucking crazy as I'm writing this. I need to place my thoughts somewhere. I need to get this out. I woke up this morning as usual and walked into the bathroom to relieve myself. I stood up and walked to the mirror, washed my hands. Seriously, what the hell? The damn mirror waved at me. I smiled and waited. I didn't know what else to do. I'm going to check again in an hour. Maybe I'm going insane. Maybe I'm just lonely and my mind is doing everything it can to change that for me. But whatever it is, I'm scared. And when will he answer me? Eleven. Was nothing. I'm not crazy. Crazy. Everything is actually quite all right. This diary is sitting on the nightstand table. I read the entries and they didn't sit well with me. I'll continue to write as that's apparently what I do. I had an amazing day today. Besides my morning, I woke up and someone called me on my phone. I'm not sure who this man was. I told him I don't know you, but he kept insisting he was my husband. Whoever. I'm sure we'll have a fun time when he gets home. You, Guinness, zero five zero five, the sleigh ride. Ah, oh, it's finally Christmas Eve. That magical night when Santa. to good children around the world and Timmy well this year Timmy had been especially good doing anything and everything possible to be an outstanding member of society as he crawled under the covers he excitedly yelled good night mom and dad shut his eyes tight trying to force himself asleep sleep didn't come for a while but finally he dozed off with dreams of a new was awakened by soft tugging on his shoulder. Could it be, he thought? Is it morning already? But as his eyes tried to focus, he realized it was still dark. Then the tugging started again. He rolled over and looked, and had half a sleep stupor could not believe what he was seeing. It was the man himself, St. Nick, Santa, Chris Green. You want to call him, it was him. The shock was on Tim's face and reassured him, though, in a cheerful voice. Anna said, Come with me, young Tim. I have a great surprise for you. Santa turned to the door. Tim was right in his heels. He followed him through the house until they reached the fireplace. Santa then said, in a voice so very pleasant, my hand, child. Don't be afraid. There is a tradition that I keep every year. The nicest kid I take for the night to help me awake on this long sleigh ride. And you, my boy, were the sweetest of all children this year. With that being said, Timmy climbed up into the seat beside the jolly old elf. Amazing. House to house, they flew in Santa. And he were having a grand time laughing and talking. When Santa was done with the house, he would split the cookies and milk. Tim was having the time of his life when he looked up and Santa exclaimed, This is the best Christmas ever. Then he turned his voice down a notch, looking into those kind old eyes. Thank you so much for this wonderful night ride. Santa leaned down. Tim thought to whisper in his ear, but instead, his neck. As he wiggled, squirmed, and tried to scream, Santa smiled with the 
we're still together every day. Jim was good to me. Four years ago, Jim and I got married. The next year, we had Jessica. That's when the cracks started to show. It's funny how rot works. By the time you get any clue that something is wrong, the problem has already been spreading underneath the calm and healthy looking surface for quite a while. It's what's under that perfect surface that ruined my life. Jim looked at me differently after Jessica was born. I assumed it was because I was a mom. I know some men She 
smiled. I want you to watch. That's your thing, isn't it? Yeah, what's your thing? Lilith looked at her eyes in the mirror. An abnormally of evolution. What? Be quiet. I watched my soulmate take off her clothes and climb on top of my husband, and they started. They were both looking into the mirror. I was sobbing. smiling at me from the screen. It was about to get worse. Lilith had clasped both of her hands around my husband, pinning them to the bed. I wish I found out who you were a long time ago, Jim. Really, why? I would have done this with you sooner. Jim started laughing. You want to know what my thing is, Jim? Hell yes. Close your eyes. Please answer me. You called the police on me. I get it. I'm not mad. Please, please answer me. 
She said the realtor had not even 
the same old 